Okay. Let's uh, get this show on the road. Hello, everyone. Hope you're doing well. Um, time for another one. So let's actually get to it. First, let's answer some questions here that was in the chat. Yeah, so um, in terms of what I'll be teaching in the summer or fall, I don't know. So if you don't know this about City College, they usually assign um, courses very late. <laughs> like Sometimes literally like a few days before the semester starts is when you find out when you're teaching. So I have no idea what I'm teaching in the summer or fall. I probably won't know until about the weekend before, if I'm lucky, um, what I'll be doing in future semesters. Um, as for, yeah, so what I, I sent out some emails to my classes on Jupiter. So I wanna start removing the students who have dropped the class. And so how you'd know if you are removed from Jupiter is if you just stop getting mass emails from me. So tomorrow in particular, I'm going to send out a mass email to you guys about the final in terms of, you know, if an issue happens during the final, what do you do? How do you reach me? All that good stuff. So just some logistical important information about the final, I'll be sending those out tomorrow. So if you don't hear about me from tomorrow, then for some reason you're not on my email list, you should reach out to me. Um, so that's, that's how you would know. Um, yeah, so that's that. And in terms of the final, just to reiterate something, nothing really new. So boom, finals on Blackboard. It will be very similar to how the sample test was. So you don't have to go through Collaboration Ultra because I know I was throwing out a lot of uh, different things that you might have to check into. So I just want to dispel the confusion. So it's through Blackboard. It will be through, it will be very similar to how I, I did the sample test with you guys on Blackboard. So you go to the same place, you go there. And you can go straight there and do your final and, and that's that. You don't even need to contact me. Uh, to, in, in general. Um, what Blackboard Collaborate Ultra and the Zoom features are about is if during the exam you need to reach out to someone, right, because you're by yourself. So if there's an issue with the exam, you can't raise your hand and someone comes to you. If during the exam you have an issue, then you can reach out to me via Collaboration Ultra or Zoom. So that's what those guys are. You don't have to use them during the final. It's just that those are how those are the ways you can reach me during the final in real time because I will be monitoring those rooms. So I'll be able to see on Blackboard that you're taking the final, so I'll be able to see you guys there, but um, I won't be proctoring you in any traditional sense. So for those of you who couldn't take my test due to the fact that you had something wrong with your um, webcam or whatever, that's a non-issue at this point um, so because you're not going to be traditionally proctored. Uh, I'll be able to see what you're doing on, on, on Blackboard. But other than that, you're kind of on your own. And so Collaboration Ultra and Zoom, the links that I sent you guys, were just in case measures, in case you really need to reach out to me during the exam for whatever reason. The exam is May 21st at 3.30 to 545. So that's Thursday. That's two days from now. Um, it will be 25 multiple choice problems. Uh, even equally weighted, you will not be able to move forward or backwards through an exam. So you do one problem at a time and you move on. Make sure that the problems are saved. There is going to be a button to click submit and move on to the next problem, but there should be like, I think there's like a green icon or with a little check mark that says saved once you've moved on. I'll also put that in the email that I'm sending out tomorrow. Um, yeah, that's pretty much that. I do not know. No, you won't be able to review anything. You won't be able to review. You won't be able to look over your final. So as far as I know, what will happen is at the end of the final, you'll see how many you got correct versus incorrect. But you won't actually be able to tell specifically which ones you got correct versus incorrect. Yeah. So you can review what the overall situation is at the end of the final. 
but you, you won't be able to review any particular questions. You won't be able to go back and do anything. So try to be right the first time. Um, and again, and again, what, what, when it comes to how I try to get you guys prepared, it's not really going to be an issue for people who are, or who are going on, uh, who are following those strategies. But um, full disclaimer, I have not seen the final. I have no idea what it really looks like. I just go and I find my own multiple choice problems that I think it makes sense and they're at a reasonable level of difficulty. And so um, don't be mad at me if, you know, we practice some problems and you're like, I never saw any problem like that on the final. Like, it's not a mock final. I didn't write the final. I don't know what it's looking like. And so what you want to take away from this is not what the particular examples are. It's just that uh, in going through these problems, you'll see where your gaps are. You'll see things that you don't understand. And you'll also get practice. It's a different kind of taking a test. Not everything do you have to work out fully. Not everything you would have to uh, do calculations for. But it's a different skill being able to take a multiple choice test. And so I want you guys to get used to that. Being used to doing a multiple choice test under timed conditions. It's, it's a different preparation. It's a different mentality. And um, yeah, if, if you're used to one uh, modality of testing, uh, switching to a new modality can be a whole other hurdle. So this is just the best way I can find to prepare you guys for the impending final. So um, there will be times when uh, during this review and during the reviews that I have been doing, you'll see questions that were easier or harder than on the actual final. I don't know, I'm just trying to do as much as possible to cover all bases. Um, yes, so for my classes, so for the GH section and the RS2 section, after the final, you should upload your written work to me through Top Hat. And so there will be that link. So if you're not in my class, that's not, nothing to worry about. If you're not in my class, then whatever Blackboard tells me your final grade is, that's what your final grade is. Um, so, yeah. And it, it'll be like 15 minutes. All right, using, using uh, the same methods that you use to upload answers of a, for the actual in-class test. Okay, so that's that question there. Yeah, so overall, also another question that came up yesterday, someone asked specifically about telescoping series. Uh, yeah, you can also ignore that. So now if I can share the screen, turn up the camera. Right, so something else to add to this ignore list. Uh, item number nine. Ignore telescoping series. Now, other than that, um, all the series tests that I gave you, you should know them. And if you go to my website, uh, you will find um, a summary of all the important uh, series tests. So there, this is the link I posted in the chat. Uh, you will have all the series tests there. There's a summary of those guys and You'll see the name of the test. Uh, of course, remember that the kth term test is really the test for divergence. And yeah, so you'll see when to use, there's a column of when to use and what conclusions you can make based on the test. So that could be a nice reference for you when you want to know how to approach a, a particular series. And again, I went through series strategies with you guys. If you're faced with a random series, how, what do you do first, what do you second? Do, do you do second, et cetera. I also did some integration strategies with you guys um, in terms of that sort of thing. And 
that is the best way to learn. Whether you're doing a, a, a test where you're writing out all your answers or you're doing a multiple choice test, thinking in terms of strategies and paradigms and approaches is much better than worrying about the particular examples because it's going to be easy for someone to fool you um, if you just practice based on the example and your strategy is, is like, well, I remember us doing a problem similar to that in class or I remember doing a problem similar to this in homework. Once you start thinking in terms of examples, your life is automatically much, much harder. And it is so easy to throw you for a curveball. It's not even going to be, it's not funny. Uh, but once you think in terms of strategies, I remember in, in the Calc 1 exam last semester even, there was, they got several integrals. And, and, and one of the easiest integrals on that exam was uh, the integral of the tangent of x over 2 or something like that, which... If you go through the strategy for integration that I gave the class, it's an easy problem. It was actually the easiest integration problem, but so many students got stumped by that question just because they saw the x over 2. It's so easy. Just putting it, if, I, if you ask the integral of tangent x, a lot of people would have that memorized. A lot of people would figure out that you can just write a sine over cosine and do a substitution. But just having that x over 2, just because they haven't really seen that, that one little tweak, that one little slash two threw a lot of people for a loop. So you don't want to get into this game where, oh, is, is, this a, is, there, is an example like this going to be on the exam? You don't want to start thinking like that because then it's going to be easy to, to be thrown for a loop. Uh, think in terms of strategies and approaches. Every time you look at an integral, there's a certain way you approach that integral. There's a certain thing you think of first. There's a certain thing you think of second, et cetera. And you... Every integral is approached that way. We understand integrals at this level fully. There is no reason to reinvent the wheel. Yet let the strategies be your guide and everything will be fine. And whether or not you're doing a multiple choice exam, that is going to benefit you. It's not about being able to solve a particular example. It's about problem solving strategy. How do you approach something? How do you think about going to solve a certain problem given that it has machinery that you're familiar with. Um, yes, and as, as, as Sar mentioned in the comments here, I, I mean, any amount of practice will be good, um, especially the closer you can practice to what, how you want to perform, the better. So um, one thing you don't want to get into is uh, practicing problems where you're taking like 20 minutes on a problem. No, you don't want to do that. So remember, you are going to be practicing problems where you're given a five minute time limit. So if you see like there's this, this huge problem in your homework where it's like, it, it'll take you like 20 minutes with a calculator to figure it out, then chances are it's going to be a waste of your time to actually attempt that. So yes, you can go through practice in Pearson MyLabs, there are multiple choice problems there that you can have selected. So yeah, practice problems that, again, there will be computational problems, like you should know how to solve a bunch of integrals. And as I mentioned with my classes, going through the integration strategies, you should be able to do a lot of integrals in your head in a few seconds. So yeah. Um, other than that, I think, yeah. So this is what we did yesterday. Now, again, you won't be getting true or false, but we sparked a lot of interesting discussion based on these true or false. They were just a warm up, uh, but we did more multiple choice uh, problems later on uh, where you had much, many more options to choose from. And I do believe that in your multiple choice, there will be five options. So you'll have A through E. And while we didn't really practice a problem like that, any problems, because I, I, I couldn't really find one, there, there will be on at least a few of these problems some um, some choices that says, oh, none of the above, right? So you, sh you should be aware that just because an answer is there, it doesn't mean it's the right answer. It's possible for all the choices to be wrong. Um, uh, what error problems? You mean like when we're approximating integrals with series and you, you want to know how many terms mean like those error problems?
Yeah, so in terms of error problems, now, one, remember, let, let me, um, maybe I can find one here. So one, remember, for Simpsons and trapezoid rule, ignore errors. Like, you, we, you don't have to know that. Uh, just know, know how to do Simpsons rule and trapezoid rule. In terms of, now I would have to think, I mean, error problems. How would you ask a multiple choice uh, question about error? Um, See if I can pull some up here. Um, Okay, so moving on to, I believe the next page is what we want to do today. There's a limit to get you started off, but uh, I assume you mean something like this. All right, so f of x is e to the minus x to the fourth. Find the first four non-zero terms of the Maclaurin series centered at zero. Okay, so something like that could be multiple choice for sure. Uh, 10a problem one, I believe this was a uh, math, this is a problem from a math 203 final in fall 2017. Right. So yeah, problem one, definitely you could do a multiple choice. They could do a bunch of series uh, choices for you to choose or none of the above. So now the 10A part two says, use the result in one to find this with an error less than that. Yeah, so they could put a bunch of multiple choice problems here. Um, of course, justifying your answer, I, I'm not sure if there's going to be a choice there. Um, but yeah, maybe, maybe we can go through, we can go over this as well. Um, so let's save this down here. So we'll go over that. Um, and, I'll, and I'll talk about how I think something like that could happen with a multiple choice problem or whatever. Um, but I wouldn't worry too much about error problems in general. It's hard to really talk about error problems on a multiple choice exam. Okay, so let's actually jump into some uh, problems. So uh, this one, here's a limit problem. Uh, not multiple choice, but let's uh, just get warmed up here. So this was a problem that we had on, uh, I think I did in one, of my, one or two of my classes, I don't even remember. Um, but uh, it threw a lot of people for a loop for a while. And how, how would we do that limit? Does it exist? Does it not exist? If it exists, what is the answer? Right, so the trick was to convert to polar. So a few people were very suspicious by going through uh, setting y equals to x and setting x equals to zero and traveling along those paths. They got the series was zero, but going through the squeeze theorem, it was very hard to actually show that that converge. So something like this uh, switch to polar was, uh, was the choice that got us to the answer a lot quicker. So this was r approaches zero. This would be r to the fourth cosine squared theta sine squared theta sine of r sine theta over, um, well, r to the fourth times cosine to the fourth theta plus sine to the fourth theta. These guys canceled. 
and this guy here approached zero, which means that this whole part here approached zero. And so the limit was actually zero. Right. So this just this is just to remind you sometimes you, uh, the switching to polar strategy. Uh, don't forget that strategy. And by polar here, I mean polar coordinates. Um, so you can switch uh, something to like uh, x is r cosine theta, y is r sine theta, x squared plus y squared equals r squared. Uh, you can also use r approaches zero to replace um, x, y approaches the origin. Now, of course, if there's a triple limit, like an x comma y comma z approaching zero comma zero comma zero, you would go from a three dimensional limit to a two dimensional limit. You'd use r and z, right? Where the r is kind of replacing the x and y. So, right. So switching to polar, a very powerful technique. I just wanted to remind you guys of that. Um, when you switch to polar coordinates with a z coordinate, that's what's called cylindrical coordinates. And you'll talk about that in the next class. Yes. So once you switch the polar coordinates, you, you actually change this two variable limit to a single variable limit, and it actually applies. The only way you can figure out from this that the limit does not exist is if the answer actually depends on theta, then that's a problem because then the answer will change depending on what your theta value is. So I think all of the examples we did with polar coordinates, the limits actually existed. Um, can, can I think of one where the limit would not exist? So let's say limit x, y approaches 0, 0 of say x, y over x squared plus y squared. So we know that that did not exist, right? Because if you go along x equals y, you would get a half. If you go along x equals 0, you would get 0. Um, so what if someone just decided to switch the polar here? Um, you, this would turn to the limit r theta. Here we'd have r squared cosine theta sine theta over here we'd have r squared. You'll notice that the r's will cancel. And so you'll end up with this limit being cosine theta sine theta. And that's an issue. That depends on theta. So answer can change. And that's a problem. So if you switch the polar in this situation, you would conclude limit does not exist. Right? So polar can help you in both situations, whether it exists or not. Right? I just I don't want you guys to forget about this tool that you have in your tool belt. Um, we didn't do much with polar coordinates, unfortunately, because of how the syllabus was altered, but um, they're still very useful. And we covered, I think we covered most of the main reasons why you'd want to use polar. Algebraically, they're very nice with, with certain situations. And you'll find that geometrically, they're going to be very nice with certain situations in the next class. So don't forget that. Let's talk about this one. Um, and... Yeah, the last problem that we did yesterday was actually a problem that uh, used uh, the Taylor series for the cosine function. And we got mixed up. Some people thought it was a geometric series when it wasn't. So knowing Taylor series, again, very important. Um, you don't want to miss out on that. But let's actually do a problem like this. So here, um, we first would look at what does the Taylor series for e to the x look like? So it's the series n goes from zero to infinity of what? Right, x to the n over n factorial. And this works for all x. And through Taylor's remainder theorem, which we're ignoring for the purposes of our syllabus, we know that this series actually describes the function e to the x. It converges to that function, which means this series and that function we can think of as one and the same which means to look at e to the minus x squared, 
is just us plugging in minus x squared into this guy. So this is minus one to the n, x to the two n over n factorial. Okay, and then, um, I'll get to that later. I'll see if I find any of those questions. Um, I have some graphing questions prepared for parametric equations, um, but I'll, I'll look for some quadric surfaces, I guess. Uh, let's see here. So it says find the first four non-zero terms. Then of course you would actually plug in uh, n equals zero, in which case you get one, n equals one, which you'll get x squared plus n equals two, you would get x to the fourth over two factorial, n equals three, you would get x to the six over three factorial, and that's the first four uh, non-zero terms. Plus dot dot dot. So they could write a bunch of uh, cho answer choices that look like this, or does not look like it, or they have changed all the signs or something like that. But you'll pick this choice, right? So that will be your choice to part A. Now it says use it to find the integral to an error of less than 0 0.01. So you want the integral from zero to a half of e to the minus x to the fourth. Was it x to the fourth or x squared? It was x to the fourth. So this is x to the fourth. So this is 4n. So this here. So this is four, then eight, then uh, 12. So this you would, you would realize we can think of it as the, the integral of one minus x to the fourth plus x to the eighth over two factorial minus x to the 12 over three factorial plus dot, 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 all of that dx. And we can think of this because of absolute convergence. We can just integrate term by term. So this would be x minus x to the fifth over five plus x to the ninth over 18 minus x to the 13 over six times 13 uh, plus dot, dot, dot between zero and one. And so this will be one minus a fifth plus an 18th minus one over six times 13. Now, of course, here it says error less than uh, 0 0.001. Okay. So for these problems, when it comes to error estimates, for integrals via series, then the alternating series approximating approximation theorem is a common tool, right? And that's the guy that tells you that taking one term approximates the sum of the first or all the terms before that. So pretty much what you will do is you'll continue going until you see a term that is actually less than 0 0.001. And so they would just list a bunch of terms that will uh, look like that. So we should keep going until we get something that's less than uh, one over a thousand, which means we actually need another, we need a few more terms here. So the next one would have been X to the 16 over four factorial. 
and this would be x to the 17 over 17 times 4 factorial. And you would keep going. And when it comes to multiple choice, I what they can do is they can either list a bunch of answer choices with terms like this, um, or they could ask how many terms are needed. But that that's that's it's harder to ask that in a multiple choice question though. So I wouldn't worry too much about that. Um, Maybe the first part, like if they were to ask you the first four terms of the integral approximation, something like that, I think you can do. But this comes down to one, you need to know about those four series that I mentioned before. They're Maclaurin series. You also need to figure out how to find the Maclaurin series of something that isn't really memorized, but you can find it based on something that was memorized. So, for example, also know how to find Taylor series via um, algebra integration differentiation. So, uh, Typical example, we did many examples of this. So something like uh, Maclaurin series for one over one plus X squared or something similar to that, or no, not that. For like an arc tangent. So when it comes to these guys, I think those would be like the most confusing. But one thing you just realize is that this is just the integral of one over one plus x squared, which you can think of as one minus minus x squared, which reminds you of uh, one over one minus x. And so you'd be able to, let's move this down here. And so you'd be able to say that that's just going to be the integral of the series minus, uh, minus x squared, minus x squared to the n, right? And, and so that's going to be its Taylor series, okay? So you need to either know Taylor series just from the memorizations and plugging into those memorizations or realize that you can integrate or differentiate functions and use known Taylor series of their integrals or their derivatives to find Taylor series. Um, yeah, essentially though, after that, asking a multiple choice problem on the error estimates, it, it'll be kind of annoying. So I would probably expect, however, if it does show up, it's the alternating series approximation thing. However, I would probably expect them to ask you, what is the answer up to the first four terms or something like that? And then they'll give you a bunch of choices where you can choose from these. However, if they ever ask you to approximate something, you just keep adding up terms until you hit a term that is less than the thing that they, than the tolerance that they gave you. And then the sum of all previous terms is going to be the approximation, right? Uh, okay. Um, that being said, let's get through the problems that I planned for today. Uh, afterwards, if we can find some quadric surface stuff, uh, we can do that. Uh, let's jump in. So we did a bunch of series problems yesterday, and it was very instructive, very insightful. <laughs> in a, in, in a, in a, in a, I don't know, might not have been fun to some of you at the time, but I was having loads of fun and. Um, it was exposing some of our gaps. So I want to kick off today with some more series problems, uh, just a few, you know, like these, uh, these four right here. Then we'll jump into some other topics. I wanted to cover 
uh, polar coordinates problems today, parametric equations problems, and integral problems. So these are some of the major topics. Um, and yeah, and I think let's, let's actually do the poll. So here are some of these guys. So, all right. Let's begin. You should see a poll on your screen. Let's start with the first problem here. Find the terms in the Maclaurin series for the function this as far as the term x cubed. Go. Give you guys another 30 seconds here. Get your answers in. All right, I'm calling it. Let's move these guys out. All right, so we have 67% going with A, 22% with E, and 11% with I, none of the above. So let's actually, uh, I think Kevin is here. Let's actually look at these guys. So here, uh, so remember E to the minus X, that's just going to be, remember E to the X is X to the N over N factorial. So you just plug in a minus X into that. And so that will be the series of minus one to the n, x to the n over n factorial. So you're just going to have an alternating sign. So it starts with n equals zero, of course. So you're just going to have a plus one, then minus x over one factorial plus x squared over two factorial minus x cubed over three factorial for up to the x cubed term. Now, of course, two factorial is two, three factorial is six. So this should look like that and that looks like uh, that's actually a so a most people got that correct okay good let's uh, move down to the next one radius of convergence of this series um let me relaunch the poll here go
Um, be sure to get your answers in. We're testing where you are. It's completely anonymous. You're not being graded, so you just uh, do your best. Most people going towards E. Okay, five more seconds, get your guesses in. And we have a couple of people coming in with D. All right, calling it for time. So let's see what we have here. We have 78% with E, we have 11% uh, with D, 11% with C. How do we do this? Remember when we want to find radius of convergence or interval of convergence, we always use the ratio test. So we're going to look at the limit of uh, a n plus one over a n. That's going to look like uh, n plus one cubed x to the n plus one over three to the n plus one multiplied by the reciprocal. Start canceling guys. So this cancels that, this cancels that. These parts here, of course, is gonna go off to one as n goes off to infinity. And so what you end up with is you're gonna have the limit going to x over three. Now we set that less than one for convergence. And so you would get x is less than three in absolute values. And that is your radius of convergence. It's E. Okay, again, most people got that right. Okay, good. We're in looking good shape. These are some uh, vector problems. I don't know if we went over things where you were specifically asked to do some basic cross products or dot products. So here is one, find the cross product of, find A cross B. A is that, B is that. Okay, go, relaunch poll. So do the calculations. Tell me what your answer is. Okay, most people are going towards B. Okay, 10 more seconds to get your answer in. Zin.
All right, calling it for time. Seems like most people think it is uh, B. And so 82% feel it's B, got 12% thinking it's D, 6% thinking it's F. Uh, let's actually do this. So A cross B. Remember how we do that? We set up I, J, K. Uh, we line up A along the top, three, five, one, line up B underneath. And now you go with that guy. So what we do is for the I component, block out everyone in that row and that column. And then you take this times this minus that times that. Right? So it's going to be um, five, it's gonna be five times minus two, that's minus 10, and minus two times one, minus two. Now, ordinarily, if this did not have the none of the above, I would stop here. All right, so this is where sometimes uh, I would stop here. So this is where sometimes you can have a, a, an advantage of multiple choice, uh, an advantage to a multiple choice problem in the sense that you don't have to fully work through a problem uh, because none of the answers have minus 12 in the beginning except choice B. So if it was a none of, if the none of the above was not there, I know B would have to be the choice. However, there is a none of the above. So it's possible that the next two components actually do mess up. So we have to continue. But under normal circumstances, if choice F was not there, I could even stop right now. I wouldn't even have to fully do the answer. But we do have to fully do the answer here because it's possible for the other two to mess up. So of course, to find the middle component, you do that. Uh, multiply these, the cross products here. So it's uh, three times minus two, you get minus six, minus a minus five, and then you take a negative of that. So in the, neg in the middle term, you take the negative of the middle term. So it's gonna be minus six plus five. This was uh, five one. Okay, now for the last term, you're gonna block out everything in the K row and K column and do the same thing. So you would get three times two, which is six, and this would be plus 25. Now, when you actually put that all together, you get minus 12 in the first one, you get one in the second, you get 31 in the third. So it's actually choice B. Okay, and go find this dot product. Getting some interesting answers here. Most people think it's C though. Yeah, 
I'll give you guys 30 more seconds, even though. it here. All right, so we have 72% thinking that it is C, number one answer. Uh, second choice is E with 17%, and we have a couple people with 11% um, thinking that it was none of the above, that they're trying to trick us. So let's actually see. So um, it's very interesting that we have a uh, few people thinking E. Now, if you go back, where are we here? Dot product. So, remember what we said about dot product? What kind of quantity is a dot product? It's a scalar, which means Remember this guy from that lecture? The dot product is a scalar, okay? All caps, red, underline, multiple exclamation points. Uh, what kind of quantity is the cross product? The cross product, where, where did I put it? Uh, it is here somewhere, is a vector. All caps, red, underline. Uh, cross product for us is a three-dimensional thing, so it's always gonna be a 3D vector. So cross product takes two 3D vectors and results in a 3D vector that is orthogonal to both vectors and its magnitude is the area of the parallelogram formed by the original two vectors. But one thing that should be clear is that the dot product is a scalar while the cross product is a vector. So here, it should automatically be the case that you would know E, F, H, G make no sense whatsoever, okay? It's a dot product, which means it needs to be a scalar. So those choices should not come up, come to mind. Um, and in, if they do come to mind, you definitely want to review the definition of dot product and cross product because they, it, it has to be a scalar for the answer here. Now, how do we compute that scalar? Uh, so if you take V236 dot with U minus one, what it looks like is you take the product of corresponding components and you add them together. You do not put them in vector components. So this is two times a minus one plus three times a two plus six times a minus one. So that's gonna be minus two plus six minus six. And those guys of course cancel out and you get minus two. So C is the answer here. Okay, now notice, uh, Choosing E is because you saw those three numbers and you decided to put them in a vector. Um, so that's where that error came from, but yes. Rookie mistake, remember when I taught this, I told you guys the mantra, you say that to yourself three times, three times before you go to bed, three times when you wake up, it keeps the boogeyman away. Dot product is a scalar, cross product is a vector. Um, okay. All right, so that was good for the warm up. Let's get to the meat and potatoes of today. So yesterday when we were reviewing, we covered 3D space. We covered a lot of series problems. We covered, we did some things on partial derivatives and vectors. So let's cover some more bases here by looking at some other topics. Uh, the, so I have a bunch of uh, problems here from polar coordinates. Uh, we have some more sequences. We have some parametric equations. These look like long form matching graphs. We have some uh, integration problems here. Uh, 
but especially in terms of integration and also in terms of series, I would highly recommend that you guys go over the lectures and you look at the strategies for approaching all of these um, because that will oh, miss some. All right, let's keep going. Let's keep the party going. Boom, polar coordinates. Match the point in the polar coordinates to either A, B, C, or on the graph below. So two comma zero is the polar coordinate. Match it with a point. I'll give you guys 10 more seconds here. Okay, time, we're calling it. 91% believes the answer is C. So remember how polar coordinates work? The first coordinate here is R. That's your distance from origin. And the second coordinate is theta, angle made with positive x-axis. So the angle made is zero, which means you're on the positive x-axis and you are two units away from the origin. So that is C. Right, so the polar coordinates version of that coordinate and the rectangular coordinates actually coincide. Let's make this one, let's make this a little bit more challenging here. How about this one? Poll is open, throw in your guesses. Minus two comma minus five pi over four. Interesting, we have a 50-50 split between uh, choice A and D. Oh, choice C just came in. <laughs> no, what would be nicer is like those guys who uh, the commentators for like horse racing or something. See who kind of wins out. And touchdown. Okay. Uh, a and D are neck and neck, but uh, A is pulling ahead. Interesting. So we're seeing what people know about uh, polar coordinates. A is starting to win out. 
A lot of people think it's A. Don't feel the peer pressure, guys. <laughs> just like, geez, everyone's choosing A. I don't know if anyone's just choosing A. But, like, no one's seeing you, so it's fine. Choose whatever you want. That, that makes sense. Don't choose, like, F, because that's not a choice. All right, 10 more seconds. Let's uh, close this off. Okay, and stop. We have 56% believing it's A, 31% thinking it's D, and 13% thinking it's C. Let me draw on the A graph just because, you know. So what does uh, pi 5 pi over 4 means? Well, it means you take pi, you know, so this is 0 and pi, and you divide it into four equal pieces. Right? You can do the same for the bottom. Now, Counting off the number of pies, uh, number of slices, is how you can figure out what your location should be. And of course, with the angle being negative, you start at the positive x-axis and go clockwise, right? So we'll start here and go and count off five slices clockwise. One, two, three, four, five. So we end up here. This is going to be the angle minus five pi over four. So now what you, you go is you go to the R. Now the R says negative two. Now whenever it says negative two, what that means is you go in the opposite direction. So your answer should be somewhere on this side. And that brings you to choice D. D is actually the answer here. But that's how you do it. Find the angle first then you move away from the origin, the distance that was described by the R. If the R is positive, you go towards that angle, in which case, if this was positive two comma minus five pi over four, the answer would be A. However, with that negative two, what the negative means, you go in the opposite direction. So you literally go pi units backwards, and that would bring you to the correct answer choice D. All right, and they're off. Find all polar coordinates of the point two comma pi over four. And the game has begun. Someone thinks it's A. One person has already finished. A lot of people thinking here. All right, we got, all right. Okay, so we're getting them in. Interesting. Seems like it's taking people in excess of a minute and 15 seconds to come up with the answer here. Four people answered so far. And we're off to the races. And C is inching against A. B is falling behind. A starts falling behind. A is pulling up second to C. Oh no, A matches C. We're on a tie. We're running it into the home stretch. Oh, neck and neck. A passes C. C passes A. Ladies and gentlemen, I haven't seen a race this exciting since. And now E out of nowhere coming from left field which is amazing since E isn't even an option. We didn't even know he was in this race.
hey, engineering ed, and we're going to be done with this problem in 30 seconds. And time. The winner is A. But should the winner be A? That's uh, an entirely different question. OK, so this actually came up yesterday in the true or false problems that we were looking at uh, when we wanted to talk about all possibilities for a polar coordinate representation. And remember uh, what we summarized is r theta. All representations will fall under the following. Uh, they will either look like r, and you can keep adding multiples of 2 pi to n pi to r. Or remember what negative r means. It means you go in completely the opposite direction. So it's like you take theta plus you add pi. Right? So that would be a 180 degrees. You go backwards. But of course, now you just add every, pretty much what you want to think of is that take pi to the angle, and then that you can repeat every 2n pi. Right? And I think another way to think about this that I wrote down yesterday was uh, theta plus an odd multiple of pi. Uh, that can also work. And so, and of course, here you can do a plus or a minus, which is what they did. They did a minus. That's this guy right here. Because if you take pi over 4 and you subtract pi, well, that's 4 pi over 4. So that gives you minus 3 pi over 4. So we could take that th minus 3 pi over 4 and put it in this position. And we have all representations with a negative r. Right, they're going to be off by pi with the positive representations, and so that kind of puts us into D, right? So we had a lot of people going with uh, uh no, not D. This should be in negative. That's C. Uh, but, but, but. Can I just move the circle? C. Because we need the negative here. We need the negative 2. The negative 2 and then the angle here should be off by pi. And this is the positive 2 with the same angle, but we can go 2 and pi. The D was not the choice because this is a positive two. Okay. So the negative here represents all representations. Okay, let's see. What do we learn here? Let's do this one. All representations of this guy. Go. Do a little shorter time here. We'll do a minute. Because of what I just told you. Let's see if you absorbed it. Still have dissenting opinion here. Most people think it's A. We have 
Some people think you need C or D. All right, let's call this one. So far, 60% think it's A, well, 20% each think it's D, C or D. So how would we do that? Well, one, one situation, of course, is going to be 10 minus 10 comma pi over three plus two n, n pi. That'd be a one. Now, of course, if we measure uh, changes to a positive 10, then this should look like something like pi over three, like plus or minus pi. I don't think they'll go outside that window, plus two n pi, right? Or some odd multiple of pi. This is actually equivalent to saying an odd multiple of pi. Anyway, so who would fall into that category? What about this? That looks like C, am I right? So we have the minus 10 comma pi over three plus any two n pi is gonna give us to the same point. Now, if I add pi to pi over three, that should give four pi over three, and then that would change the r to a positive and then make uh, any two n pi after that point. Let's see. Okay, so we have a, a bunch of questions in one here. So this one is for problem five. So let's look at problem five, change the given polar coordinates to rectangular coordinates. So all of these, the answer choices, the answers are Polar coordinates, but switch the rectangle. Interesting. Most people are gravitating towards D here. Do another 20 seconds here. Okay, let's call it 78% think it's D, 6% says C, 11% says B, 6% says A. So most people thinking it's D. Now, of course, X is equal to R cosine theta. So that's going to be six uh, cosine three pi over two, which we know is zero. So that automatically takes these guys out. And we know that why, well, I mean, 
you should know where the three pi over two. So y would be r sine theta. So this is r sine theta. So this is going to be six sine three pi over two, which is minus six. So that's D is the answer. Um, also, you could just know the picture. If you're at six three pi over two, you're here, right? Because that's three pi over two coming around here. So a couple ways you can look at it. You can just think of the picture. Where would that angle end up? It would end up on the negative x-axis. And so um, that the negative y-axis. And so that means your x coordinate is going to be 0 while your y coordinate is negative, And only d fits the bill. So that makes sense. And yeah, when it comes to polar coordinates, I think this is one of the problems that can actually show up. I launched a poll for problem 6. Converting between polar and rectangular back and forth is something that they're going to test you on. I'm pretty sure, 95% sure that problems like this will show up because there's not much to test you on when it comes to polar coordinates. All right, and most people think it's D, 85%. 8% think it might be A or B. So if we look at problem six here, now we can see that if we looked at minus power of three, it would be here and then negative four. So we do expect the answer to be over here in the second quadrant. So we want the x to be negative and the y to be positive. So that automatically erases these guys. So now it's between these two. And so now all you have to do, you just find one of these coordinates. So here, if we set, say, x equals r cosine theta, Remember, cosine of minus pi over 3 is just the same as cosine of positive pi over 3. So that's going to be a half. So you have minus 4 times positive a half. So you get minus 2. Your x needs to be minus 2. So it's d. Right? So here I use a combination of the graphing and actually doing a calculation. So I don't have to calculate both of them. But I could calculate both directly. But uh, yeah, what about problem seven? I don't know. Let, let's actually just do this together. Let's not worry about a poll right now. Um, so here, minus, so if I look at seven, minus seven comma zero puts me over here, right? Which means when angle is zero minus seven. Yeah, so that's actually looks the same as rectangular coordinates. So that's B. If we look at problem eight, so 10 minus pi over four, 10 puts me down here. That's in the fourth quadrant. So my X should be positive while my Y is negative, which means that's gone, that's gone. And I just have these two. So now what I would do is see who's the whole number, or if anyone's a whole number, maybe you can do like a, let's, why not do the sign? X equals uh, cosine. X equals R cosine theta. 
And I, I would opt to do the X because for the cosine, the cosine is an even function. So a negative angle and a positive angle is going to give me the same answer. So I can essentially ignore the negative angle when I'm doing the cosine. So that's why you see me calculating the X all the time. Um, cosine of pi over four is radical two over two. So that goes, gives five radical two. So I'm going to choose the remaining answers where the X coordinate is five radical two. That's D. Looking at problem nine, um, 11 pi over three. So pi over three basically means you cut pi into three equal pieces. 11 pi over three means you take uh, 11 of those pieces. So you would do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 10, 11. So you're in the, uh, the fourth quadrant here. And we're at a distance from 16. So our coordinate is somewhere down here. So I know that my um, x is positive and y is negative again. So that eliminates those two possibilities. Now I just want to see, well, what is my x coordinate going to be? It's r cosine theta, 11 pi over 3. Well, all students take calculus. And so you know that the cosine is going to be positive there. Um, and so it's going to give you the same answer as cosine of pi over 3. Cosine of pi over 3 is a half. So that would give you uh, 8. So the answer there is C. And hopefully now you're seeing um, like the shortcut for problems like this. Now this is going the opposite. So I'll launch a poll here to make sure that people know how to go the opposite way. So we're looking at this question right here. Rectangular coordinates are given find the polar coordinates. Once we're going towards D, give you guys another 30 seconds. Okay, time, we're split at 75% and 25%, 75% going to D. Um, let's actually see. So uh, we know that theta is equal to, uh, a couple ways you can do this. You can do tan inverse of y over x. There are like three forms you can use to find theta. So tan inverse of y over x is one of them. And so 
I can find the tan inverse of minus four radical three over four. So that's just tan inverse of minus rad three. Now that is going to give us, the reference angle for that is going to be pi over three, of course, minus pi over three. Minus pi over three, this is equivalent to, um, five pi over three. So I know it's either A or it's uh, D. So now let's find the R. The R is the square root of X squared plus Y squared. So that's gonna be the square root of 16 plus 16 times three that's the square root of 4 times 16. That's going to be 2 times 4, which is 8. So D, D would be the answer. And again, that's using polar coordinates, uh, the equations. So this is uh, an equation that you can use to switch from rectangular to polar, these are the two main ones. So the x squared plus y squared equals r squared. You can use that to go from, if you know x and y to find r. And if you want to use, uh, find the x coordinate, use x equals r cosine theta, y equals r sine theta. These are the guys that are useful in going from uh, polar to rectangular. And these ones that I just boxed, these are useful for going from rectangular to polar. These are all done in, in lectures, by the way, so I'm not really gonna go over everything again, but um, yeah. Most people thought that D was the answer, and that is correct. How about this one here? Launch a pole, go. Convert the rectangular equation to a polar equation. people putting their answers in. Make sure you're actually attempting this. In my estimation, this is highly likely to be a problem type that would show up. Converting between rectangular and polar coordinates as well as converting from Rectangular ways of representing equations to polar ways of representing equations.
you guys another 30 seconds, get your answers in. Okay, let's cut it here. Spent a little more time than I wanted to, but I wanted enough people to try to get their answers in. So at the end there, C kind of edges out with 40%, 30% thinking it's B, 20% thinking it's D, 10% thinking it's A. Let's actually see if C is the answer. So we have the equation, uh, Uh, start multiplying out. I think 16 squared is 256. So those you can subtract from both sides and you can get X squared plus Y squared equals 32 X. Of course, now switching to polar, that's R squared equals 32 R cosine theta. And you can divide both sides by R So C, C is the answer, um, which most people thought, but overall 40% thought it was C. So definitely a problem type that I would say you should know. Um, when it comes to polar coordinates, I think these are the two main types of problems that could come up. They can actually attach either switch between coordinates or switch between equations. We have some more coordinate problems here. Well, let's actually do some more equation problems. So let's try this one. For a given rectangular equation, write the equivalent polar form. So x equals six. You know, 30 seconds for this one shouldn't take you too long. Okay, let's call it, we have an equal number of people thinking it's A or D uh, with a few thinking it's B. So 40%, 47% think it's A, 
same thing it's d semper think think it's b x equals six so we're looking at problem 19. x equals six well this means that r cosine theta equals six which means that r if i divide both sides by cosine i get that so that's a right that shouldn't take you too much time what about 20? 20 is a little bit more, relaunching the poll for 20. I'll give you 30 seconds here. Okay, stop there. Everyone thinking it's A, 100%. Of course, if you have x squared plus y squared minus 10x equals zero, that just means r squared minus 10r cosine theta equals zero. Can divide both sides by r and you get r is equal to 10 cosine theta. So yes, A is the answer. I think there was another one down here. Okay. Okay, this one. Convert the polar equation r equals two divided by two sine theta minus three cosine theta to rectangular form. Go. Most people thinking it's C so far. Give another thirty seconds on this. And time, most people thinking it's C, 70%. 10% think it's none of the above, 10% thinking it's B, and 10% thinking it's A. So let's actually see. Um, so here I have R is equal to two over uh, two sine theta minus three cosine theta. I would actually multiply across, just multiply this up. You have two r sine theta minus three r cosine theta equals two. Now this is of course y and this is of course x. Test that. Two y minus three x equals two. Now, uh, issue with this one, a, because you see that 2y minus 3x there, but the fact that there's an r here is a problem. So you can have the r in the rectangular form. 
So A could not be the answer because you're mixing R's with X's and Y's. Um, B is an algebraic error. You might think of uh, multiplying both sides by R, but in B, the error was they multiplied the left side by R, but they multiplied the right side by one over R. That would be this. And so those don't actually work. This guy sign mix up here. So C is actually the answer here, which most people got 70%. Let's move these guys. Over here. Who do we want to do next? So these are some more switching between coordinates. I'll probably leave those for you guys to actually try. But be strict and time yourself with these. I'll, I'll leave these for you guys. I won't do any, I'm kind of getting bored with those questions. Um, maybe we'll do some limits to kind of uh, segue into the parametric stuff. Just make sure I'm not missing anything here. No, we're fine. Like I said, I'll leave this for you guys to do later. So we're almost uh, towards the end here. So we have the, oh, no, never mind. I have a bunch. <laughs> So maybe let's get through these quickly. Rapid fire. Problem eight here, this limit. I mean, I guess I could do the poll, see what we get. Okay, go, problem eight. Give you another 15 seconds here. Okay, let's stop. We have 70% thinking it's C. 10% thing is D, B, and A, respectively. And yeah, again, ratio of leading coefficients is how you think about this. This, the, without the minus one to the N cubed, this would actually approach a half. And then you have a minus one to the N cubed, which means it's alternating sign. It's shifting between plus or minus a half. Does not exist, okay. Um, what about nine? Well, for nine, Couple ways you could do this. One is to do a change of base formula. Realize that log to the base five of n is ln of n divided by ln of five. And log to the base nine of n is really ln of n divided by ln of nine. So this actually, oh, it's the limit, limit. So this we can look at as ln of n over ln of five times ln of nine over ln of n. These guys cancel. And so we have A is that limit. 
this guy. Now, cosine of n in absolute values. So if I take the absolute value of this guy, that is going to be less than or equal to one over log two of n. And that approaches zero. And we had a theorem that if uh, a sequence in absolute value approaches zero, then the original sequence approaches zero. So you can use a squeeze theorem here to determine that that limit is actually zero. And as you can see at this point, problems like this, they might look complicated, but they really shouldn't take you a lot of time. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a balance between knowing about conceptual things versus actually going through the computations. Uh, here's something I want to make sure you guys know how to do. Um, Eliminate the parameter and obtain an equation in X and Y. Uh, you can actually ignore, I mean, I'll leave that here. But what would this be if you eliminate the parameter? So this is not a multiple choice problem, so it's not a poll. Just wanna make sure that you guys actually know how to do this. It's, it's the third type of problem that I think can show up with uh, parametric equations. We're not doing calculus of parametric equations, so not much, not many options here. Someone tell me what you think the answer is. Any biters here? Yeah, why in terms of rad x is gonna be an issue because then you have to worry about pluses or minuses. So I probably wouldn't wanna do that. Here, I will look at this. This means that our t is equal to y minus two then I would plug that in here. So that would mean that our x is equal to, well, y minus one squared. And so that's a sideways parabola. If you take a radical, you need plus or minus. So it's, it's kind of, it's gonna be weird if you look at it that way. And so, What do we have here? Square root of x minus y equals three. Anyway, so this would be moved up here at one, and then there's a sideways problem like that. All right, so when y equals one, your x hits zero and it opens to the side. Now in terms of figuring out the direction, I'm not sure if they'll ask you that on something, but you just plug in numbers. So if you plug in uh, t equals minus 10, you would get, say, x equals, well, x is always going to be positive. But minus 10, you would get x equals minus 9 squared. And your y would be uh, minus 8. So you'll start at the coordinate uh, 81 comma minus eight. So I guess somewhere down here. So this is t equals minus 10. Then if you go to t equals plus 10, your x would be 11 squared, which is 121. And then your y would be 12. And so those are both positive. It's 121 comma 12. That's over here. So you'll notice that you're moving in 
this direction. Okay. So for a multiple choice, they might have a picture like this or something of that sort, or maybe they'll ask you about the equation. Um, now, when it comes to that, just because of the answers I saw in the chat box, let me just make sure. So another way to think of this would be to say, this is plus or minus radical X equals Y minus one. So your Y would be one plus or minus radical X. Now, if the answer choices were just one plus radical X or one minus radical X, then what you would say is, um, like you would say that the answer is not there, none of the above or something like that. So be careful when you're taking the radical, you notice that you'll have two signs here. Uh, let's see. Primary equations this and that describe, well, if I plug in T equals, so from here, I would have t equals 2x, and then I could plug that into the y. So your y would be 3 times 2x squared minus 1. So that's a parabola. This, uh, notice that if I take x squared plus y squared, I would get 4 squared. So that's that. On the interval, do the equation da, 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 describe exactly one circuit of a circle? So I think they mean to. Uh... Okay, so we just need to make sure that this fully goes through zero to two pi, which um, means that we want that. Yeah, so those shouldn't be too bad. I don't know. Um, this one, parametric equations, describe uh, the curve to the right. So when I see something like this, this weird curve that you're, you're not going to really know the equation for. Um, well, one thing I would know is that this guy here is a circle, so I can automatically take that out of the running. But now I have to look at these guys. And at this point, I would just uh, test coordinates. So start with say t equals minus pi, what would have happened? Uh, so my x cosine of uh, pi, cosine of pi is minus one. And this, and I'm looking at choice b, what would b give me at uh, t equals minus pi? So cosine of pi is minus one, and here, if I plug in minus pi, the y would be zero. So I should have minus one comma zero. So that is here. So that it's looking good for b. What about, what would c be at minus pi? So if I plug in minus pi there, that's cosine of two pi, I would get x equals plus one comma and, and y equals zero. So that's that. Uh, so that's not good enough. So we need some more points here. Uh, what about positive pi? Well, this is how I do it. I would just test points. Or maybe try to make one of them zero. You could plug in something like pi over two. Then for b, my x coordinate is going to be zero, and my y coordinate would be zero. So that's the origin. If I go to C and plug in T equals pi over two, then my X coordinate is going to be minus one. My Y coordinate would be one. And so, yeah, so that's off. So it's not C, it's B. Of course, the major pitfalls here is for you to know your trig well enough to just plug in a bunch of things and get to an answer quickly. Um, integration. Is there anything I want to do 
on parametric equations left. Uh, maybe I'll leave these for you guys. Let's let me go through some integration with you guys. Although here, I believe this was going along with this question right here. And this one did in class. And you guys should try these. Okay, so I'll leave those for you guys. But yeah, when it comes to parametric equations and polar coordinates, um, I showed you guys the main ones, the main types of problems that I think they could ask you. Switching between coordinate systems. So here's a coordinate go between polar and rectangular. Switching between equations like this one. Here's an equation in polar, go to rectangular. Or here's an equation in rectangular, go to polar. Um, eliminating the parameter and rewriting a parametric equation as a single Cartesian equation. Um, something that could come up. Um, matching a graph, so they give you an example of a graph and then give you a list of equations and then you try to match it with that. Yeah, in, in my mind, those, those are the things that it makes sense to actually um, ask about. Okay, so let's do some integration. Let's uh, spend a little time here. Do problem one here. It's kind of a warm up. That might be something that you would have learned at the end of Calc 1. But we have a pole going here. So first answer in with B, two people think it's B, three people think it's B. Some people think it's C. Five more seconds here. Okay, we'll stop. 90% are going with B. Let's see here. In the figure below, uh, the parabola, negative da da da, is G. So this guy here is G. And the exponential curve is H. So this guy here is H. G is on top. So the curve is the integral of g minus the integral of h. And again, it's vertical. So you would have like your a and your b on this. So yeah, it's g minus h, it's b. All right, nice warm up. Let's do some more things. into some more integration techniques here. More parametric equations and matching graphs. I'll probably leave those for you guys though. Polling box was in the way and got me to click off of this. Hey, boom, let's review some integration. Try to make quick work of these. X to the fourth cosine X to the fifth. Or 
We already have someone with B. That was lightning fast. So far we have 100% going on B, let's actually just end this, let's call it. Um, so of course for integration, you also now know the fundamental theorem of calculus. So if integration is a problem for you, you do have the option of differentiating the answers. So you can actually notice that if you were to differentiate B, you would actually get the answer. Vice versa here, you could do a substitution, U equals X to the fifth, D, you would be five X to the fourth DX, and then you have the one fifth comes out. Um, and you know that the integral of cosine is positive sine. And so a couple ways there to know that B would be the answer, but yeah, you should be able to tell that relatively, relatively quickly. Um, so here is a, another problem. You have to evaluate the integral x squared e to the x. A good first step would be substitution or substitution here or integration by parts. Okay, we call that here. Just have a few people answering. Maybe I'll leave it up a little bit more. All right, let's call it here, man and a half. Most people going with C, 75%. We have a few people with D and E. Um, I would agree with the C. One thing should be clear is that you should know that integration by parts would actually work on that, okay? And of course, according to Liate, U is going to be the X squared and the DV is going to be the E to the X. That being said, could making a substitution before actually help you out? Well. If you did the substitution of u equals e to the x, you would have to worry about what the x squared is gonna be. The x, the x then would, is going to become an ln of something, and then you're gonna have an ln of squared, which you're going to have to do with by parts. You actually make your life a little bit more complicated by doing that. Um, if you go with the u substitution of u equals x squared, then you'd end up having to deal with an e to the radical x, which again, to kind of deal with that guy, you need to go through by parts anyway. Why not just start out with by parts? Uh, three is the best strategy here. Right. Now, I don't really think they would ask a problem like this specifically. They'll actually just ask you to compute this integral, but knowing how to approach it is a good thing. So I ask you guys, would you know how to approach this? By parts is the best way to approach that. And again, going by integration strategies, which we've covered in class, we know that um, seeing the two different types of functions, a polynomial times an exponential, kinds of screams out integration by parts to you in term, as far as strategies go. Um, you're of course going to look, does a basic rule cover this or can I simplify to get a basic rule or would a substitution work? But again, you should have enough experience at this point to know that uh, substitution is not gonna really help me there. And integration by parts just kind of jumps out at you. Let's uh, move on to this problem right here. Assume f is a function with continuous derivatives. Furthermore, assume the following. What is this equation? What, what is this uh, 
definite integral here, you have five answer choices. Go, I'll give you guys, I don't know, two minutes on this one maybe. Finally, have an answer coming in E. Three people think it's E. Not enough information to solve the problem here. This is one of those none of the above situations, it seems. At least people believe so at the moment. Give another 30 seconds here. All right, let's wrap it up. You know, we have someone else coming in. Okay, be nice, another, t uh, another 15 seconds. Okay, let's stop. So we have the majority feeling that they don't have enough information to solve the problem, 63%. 25% think the answer is C and 13% think the answer is B. What is the actual answer? I do not know. I'm working this out in real time just like you guys. So let's actually see what we have here. So of course, there is a double integral in the integra integration. So I'm thinking integration by parts, right? So I would do a, a u equals 2x minus 4. My dv would be the f double prime. So my du would be 2 dx. My v would be f prime. And so I would go with u times v minus the integral of v du. So I'm thinking integration by parts here. So that is going to look like u times v minus the integral, and of course, this is going to be evaluated at two and seven, minus the integral of v, from two to seven of v du, so it's two f prime. Okay, so now what would happen? I would plug in seven. So this would be 10 times f prime of seven minus if I plug in two here, I would get zero. And this part here, of course, the integral of f prime is going to just be f of x. So this would be 10 f prime of seven minus two f of seven plus two f of two. Now, do we have all those answers? f prime of seven, yes. F of seven, yes. F of two, yeah. So we have enough information here. So F prime of seven is actually three. 
f of seven is 10, and f of two is five. So B. All right, so some people would have gotten here and realized, oh, F prime of X, and I'm gonna need to plug in a two. I don't have enough information. However, the trick is by plugging in two, you actually kill that whole term because this part is gonna to go to zero. So you actually didn't need to know what F prime of two is. We do have enough information to determine this integral and it is 20. Nice problem. I thought that would be a nice problem. I didn't realize how nice it would be. I, I, I didn't work out any of these ahead of time. I'm working it out with you guys. Assume this f is a differentiable function. Which of the expressions equals this? Launching another poll. Let me know what you guys think. Okay, so we have, uh, they're all neck and neck now between A, B, and D. D is pulling ahead. Give you guys another 30 seconds to figure this out. Okay, let's call time end. So most people think it's D with 55%. Uh, we have three people thinking it's B, 27% and 80% thinking it's A. So let's set the record straight for example here. For B, no, definitely not. So remember, uh, uh, integral of product is not the product of integrals. Remember, even with differentiation, you need a whole product rule to go through. So you can't just integrate the x cubed to get x to the fourth over four and integrate the f prime to get the f and stick them together. Does not work. Um, f g, the integral of that is not equal to the integral of f times the integral of g in general. So that's them trying to catch you. It's a very common mistake that students make for whatever reason. Um, don't make that mistake. The integral of a product is not the product of integrals. So that's, that's just really trying to fake you out here. Here I have two separate products. So I, I have a product of integrals and without even knowing what the F is. So I'm thinking in by parts is how I'm going to want to do this. Now I would say U is equal to the X cubed. That's gonna allow me to break the powers down while my DV is equal to the F prime, which is going to allow me to get rid of the prime. So that's a smart choice for U and V. My du is going to be 3x squared dx. My v is going to be f. 
And so my integral is going to be u times v minus the integral of v du. And that guy is d, which most people chose d. So d was the correct answer here. B is one of those things that um, you really need to check your concepts if you are if you guess to B. It's 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 one of those mistakes that are along the lines with someone choosing a vector for a dot product. Uh, dot products are scalars. Cross products are vectors. So there are some things that should be right away not the answer. What do we remember about partial fractions? Well, let's see what we remember. What is the form of the complete partial fraction decomposition of this function? Go. Something's at the door. Most people going with uh, D here. Few people going with A. Partial fractions, very important integration technique. You do want to know how to do this or recognize it being done. Give you guys another 15 seconds on this one. Okay, let's call it 80% thinking is D. 20% thinking it's A. Well, let's see. So remember the strategy for partial fractions. First of all, make sure the fraction is proper. Second, factor fully the denominator. Third, break up the denominator in such a way that one, you have to count up to multiplicities for repeated roots. So if you have that X to the four, uh, if you have that X squared plus four all squared, you will count up to that. You would have the X squared plus four and then you have the x squared plus four all squared. Uh, then you would have the x minus one, then you'd have the x minus one all squared. Then you have an x minus three. So it was proper and the denominator was fully factored. So we have that so far. Now, the guys that go on top, remember, they are one degree less than the factor in the bottom. So in this case, uh, this is ax plus b. This would be CX plus D, because again, it's following the inside factor. This will just be E, F, G. So it should look something like that. They might order things in a different order, but in your head, that's how things should kind of break out. And so that leaves you with D here. D fits that mold in pretty much the exact order that I wrote it down. I, I, did, I wasn't even looking at the answer choices when I did this. So yeah. That's D. That's the process of partial fractions in a very quick nutshell. More integration. So we're seeing that some of us are forgetting some things about integration.
Okay, here's another one. Go, find this integral. Quickly. Let me do this one with you guys. Okay, grabbing a piece of paper here. Oh, nice, someone got to an answer the same time I got to an answer. Oh, we have things uh, being split here. A, B, C, D are into. No one thinks the answer is E, but we have uh, a lot of people thinking among the other choices here. Give you guys another 30 seconds here. Okay, we'll call it at three minutes. So of course a problem like this, it would you would have like up to five minutes, but hey, let's actually try to get it quicker and then we'll have like two minutes to double check our work here. So uh, C wins out, 58% believing it's C, 70% thinking it's B or D respectively with 8% thinking it's A. Now the person who finished it as fast as I finished it believed the answer was A, that was the first, uh, answer that came up on the board. Let's actually look. Now, of course, here you see a problem like this. You would think partial fractions. So you're definitely going to think of this as x plus one over x plus two dx. Now, of course, what I would use here is the cover up method, right? We have linear non-repeating factors. So to figure out who would go on the x plus one, don't waste your time going through that whole process that I taught you guys with plugging convenient values or uh, combining coefficients of like terms. This is a prime candidate for the cover up method. So you go to the cover up the x plus one and plug in what makes it zero, right? So you'd plug in x equals minus one. Notice that here you would get one on top. Plus, if you, if you cover up now the x plus two and plugged in what made that zero, you would end up with um, a minus two, because that would be minus six plus four, divided by, plug in minus two here, a minus one, which ends up being positive two. So that's the partial fractions over here. And now you can just actually realize that those guys would become LNs when you integrate them. Factor off that two 
And that looks like uh, C, it looks like. So C was the answer. Most people got that. Boom, choose the correct completion of the statement. The integral of one to infinity of one over x to the p. Boom, go. Give you guys like 10 seconds for this. Yeah, a lot longer. Let's actually end that right there. Most people think the answer is C. Now, yes, we know it converges for greater than one. However, I don't like how this is phrased. Um, that is the closest one to the answer, though. I would say something like diverges otherwise. because right, there's nothing really stopping p from being negative right in general right you'll just flip it and make it positive but c is the best of the choices here okay do this one quickly Okay, we have an answer coming in for A. Few people coming in at A. Some people coming in at E. The E folks are overtaking the A folks. Ten more seconds here. Some more people coming in with A. It's almost neck and neck. Between A and E, which is the name of a TV channel, I think. Okay, let's stop there. We have 60% thinking it's E, 40% thinking it's A. Um, let's see here. Yeah, right off the bat, um, A, no, can't have a negative inside a log. So that's right off the bat, A is out of the running. Um, so that's one thing. Second of all, 
this might be something that you can gloss over and not realize it's an improper integral, but they had uh, the integral diverges here, which makes me even start really looking now. Notice that this is improper. Now remember what makes an integral improper. If the upper limit is infinity and or the lower limit is negative infinity and or our function is undefined somewhere on this interval. Notice that this is undefined since one over x minus one is not continuous. I shouldn't say undefined, I should say not continuous. At x equals one, which is on this interval. So it is definitely improper. And so what you do with an improper integral, you kind of, you have to split it up, exposing one bad point per integral. So you would think of this as the integral from minus one to one of, I'm, I'm, I'm jumping the gun here, putting in the ln, plus the integral from one to five. Anyway, the integral here is going to be ln of x minus one between minus one and one, plus the ln of x minus one between one and five. Now. Obviously, if you plug in the five in here, you're going to get an ln of four. No one here has ln of four, so that automatically also eliminates all those possibilities. However, if you were to still go here and plug in a one, you'll realize you get log of zero, log zero undefined. So, yeah. Many uh, things along the way suggested the does not, a, the integral diverges, and we didn't even have to go through all of this. Um, once I realize I, I hit a division by zero, the integral of this is going to give me a log and I'm going to have to plug in x equals one. It's not going to work. Um, so you, you didn't even have to fully do the problem here. Figure out diverges. Okay, this one here. The indefinite integral, cosine to the seven sine x dx. Cosine to the side and x sine x dx. And we're about in the home stretch here. I'll wrap up the class in a little bit. But hopefully you're you're seeing some of the things that you need to brush up on. I'm going to call it in five. Okay, so we have 67% believing the answer is E. Now, a couple ways you could do this. You could actually just differentiate. So you could just find the derivative um, of the answers very quickly if you're, if integration isn't your thing, which I mean, it's Calc 2, it kind of should be your thing. But other than that, what I would do here is like a substitution, U equals cosine. Your D would be minus sine X DX. And so you'd end up with the negative of U to the seventh DU, which of course goes to minus U to the eight over eight. And then you realize that U is the cosine. So that's E. B. Uh, the other answer choice some people thought was B. Not really sure why you would think that. Um, don't see a nice way to get to a sign to the eighth power there. But yeah, so let's see, where do we have here? One, two, three. So I'll leave these equations for you to do. The, the parametric, the matching graphs. Um, let's actually look at And maybe I'll leave this series for you to do. We did a lot of series problems. But let's finish up with these three problems here. Okay, boom.
I already have someone with an answer. Give you guys 15 more seconds. So we'll stop there, 78% think it's G, most people. Uh, we have 11% apiece thinking it's A or H. Integral of secant squared is tangent. Plug in pi over four, tangent of pi over four is one minus tangent of zero. So G is the answer. Going with this one. Already have an answer in for G. Give another 15 seconds for this one. Calling it. Most people think it's G again, 91%, but the remaining think it's C. All right, so integral of one over one plus X squared. This is our tangent. Of course, going from zero to one, zero to one. So this is tan inverse of one minus tan inverse of zero, which you know is zero. And that's pi over four, it's G. Find the partial fractions D comp here. Or just the value of A, I guess. We have a few uh, person thinking none of the above. Most people thinking it's D though. Okay, let's actually do that. Again, here I would think of, well, X over X squared minus one. Well, that's what's going to be X over X minus one times X plus one. So, I'd break that up into x minus one, x plus one, and of course, a is on top of the x plus one. 
So I would use the cover up method, go back here, cover up the x plus one, plug in minus one for x. I would end up with minus one divided by uh, minus two. So D, positive a half. Let's see here. Did I have anything else? No, just those problems that I said. And I don't know, it's, it's getting pretty late. I know you guys are probably tired or brain dead at this point, but I did, let's see something here. So overall, I wanna wrap up, but I, I remember, I just remembered someone asking about identifying conic sections. Yeah, I don't really see a lot of multiple choice problems like that. I mean, I see some long form problems, but I don't know. I, I think I think I'm gonna wrap up here. Even though we didn't get to those examples, I will leave these guys. There are a few guys here and here that I want you guys to try and make sure that you can do. Uh, but that's kind of it. I think we covered the major bases at the very least. We practiced doing multiple choice problems um, under time pressure, and I hope that was helpful. At the very least, it, it does uh, indicate to you some things that you might have gaps with. We've seen um, so yeah, uh, we spend these two days going over a lot of stuff. I hope it will be helpful. Uh, I definitely know it will be helpful if you actually approach things. Correctly, I can't promise that the you'll have problems of exactly these types, but just the act of going through this situation should be very helpful. And again, if I find out any pertinent information about the final, I will let you guys know. I will post this video, send you guys all the link. Uh, well, if you're in my class, it'll pop up in the regular playlist for the class. I'll send anyone who's not in my class the link. Yeah, we're gonna wrap up there. It's been uh, it's been a wild one, wild semester. But uh, we're gonna stop there. <laughs> so spend as long yet today as we did yesterday. But hopefully you guys, uh, that was helpful. Good luck on Thursday. If you have any questions, you know how to reach me. If I hear anything, I will let you guys know um, as soon as I can. That being said, good night, everyone. Uh, ciao, I guess there's nothing else to say.